from these, these two laws of nature, uh, Hobbes then deduces uh, a total of 19 laws. So laws 3 to 19 are just corollaries of this idea that people have to agree to trade off uh, some of their liberties to uh, steal stuff from each other. So um, there's a number of them essentially um, taken together. Um, what it means is that in order to, um, in order to, in a game theoretically convincing way, agree not to hurt each other, you have to agree to institute a lot of things uh, like um, following the rules that you've figured out. Uh, you have to uh, figure out um, some system of mediation, so something that when, it, when evolved is a system of law courts. Uh, you have to have a, a system for that to be um, for that stuff to be implemented by uh, having uh, people imprisoned or punished or whatever. Um, those follow on from some of the early laws of how a government could actually be initialized uh, in, computers, in computer programming terms. So you can't just snap your fingers and have the law courts. Uh, you have to have, um, in principle, you have to be able to, um, somebody has to go first and uh, just uh, as a generously uh, agree to uh, give up something. You know? There's some further laws that it would be then sensible um, if you're a rational, um, well, a super rational game player, um, that you have to be grateful for somebody uh, going first and giving up some stuff. Uh, you have to then have um, a system for you to cooperate basically and from cooperating basically to set up a more advanced um, system of government. And the end point of this is that in order to set up this government, um, with some sort of legal system, what you need is an absolute sovereign uh, which controls this system. Um, I'm skipping through the logic because I've been drinking on the beach at this point, but I think, I, as, as far as I understand, um, you need the absolute sovereign because it goes back to the um, different people have different preferences. Basically, um, there's a, you have, some, somehow there has to be randomly assigned by drawing a lot or something. Uh, somebody has to be chosen to be king or something like that uh, because you can only have uh, one of these hopefully rational people um, enforcing their idea of ethics as the laws of this system. So... Uh, this, this, this is where it's getting a bit worse. Uh, it's suggesting, okay, we need this absolute, uh, absolute sovereign. Um, oh, on the way to that, though, uh, in passing, he does introduce the concept of non-alienable rights. So because the principle of what you're doing is uh, giving up rights in order to secure for yourself um, security or not to be uh, beaten up, um, what you definitely haven't given up in any of this and can't give up is the right to self-defense and some other rights. So this is where you get Hobbesian liberalism. So paradoxically, despite the fact on one strand of argument, he goes for um, what we need is an absolute sovereign, or an absolute monarch, say. Um, along another strand of reasoning, he does actually believe that people have some non-alienable fundamental rights. And um, also argues um, how these should influence the sovereign to make good quality laws. So this, the, the, these, these are paradoxical, but um, he gets both of them from a fixed starting point, which is interesting. Um, sovereign authority. So the, the government which Hobbes says we need in order to uh, oversee this system in which the laws of nature are being obeyed uh, is we need this sovereign authority. Uh, essentially, the, the sovereign has absolute power to set laws. Uh, there are various things. Um, so once you have the sovereign uh, the citizens are a bit screwed. They can't change the form of the government. They will have some rights, and there are some ways the laws should be set up to be good laws, uh, but he says um, the citizens can't be allowed to just change the government as they like. Not the form of the government, anyway. Um, and people cannot uh, protest against the institution of the sovereign if a majority or a large part of the, other, the rest of the population agree to do it. Um, and the sovereign, when they decide to put in laws, the people simply have to obey that. That's simply part of this. In order to obtain this security by having these laws followed, people simply have to do what they're told by the absolute sovereign. Um, and the, the sovereign is judge of what is necessary for the peace and defence of his subjects, and I put in, crucially, under what doctrines are fit to be taught to them. So Hobbes is very much in favour of the sovereign being allowed to censor uh, 
uh, censor uh, the universities and to choose uh, what uh, doctrines are allowed to be taught by the church. And if this sounds pretty bad, Hobbes says, well, yes, but the alternative, remember, is much worse. So he says, uh, reason for the absolute sovereign. Here, a man may object that the condition of the subject is very miserable um, because it's completely obnoxious to the, uh, the, the things that the subjects want. Um, it's the, they're totally at the mercy of whatever the sovereign uh, wants because the sovereign has unlimited power over the subject. And uh, commonly, he says, uh, they that live under a monarch think it the fault of the monarchy and they that live under the government of democracy, think it's the fault of the democratic government. Uh, and they attribute all inconvenience to that form of government which they live under. In fact, he says, this is a mistake, because uh, they're forgetting what it is that they've gained by having a government. Uh, so they are uh, blaming the government for all of their woes, uh, not considering that the estate of man can never be without some incommodity or other, and the, gr the greatest of all possible woes they could be suffering um, is what would happen to people in general in this state of nature. Uh, this is, what, however bad their situation is under the absolute uh, sovereign, um, it's scarcely sensible. It's uh, only negligibly bad uh, in respect of the miseries and horrible calamities that accompany a civil war or the dissolute condition of masterless men without subjugation to laws. Okay, so he says, um, bear with us because uh, even though the absolute sovereign sounds pretty bad, he's going, to put some he's going to put some recommendations as to what sort of absolute sovereign it should be, and it's going to end up being much better than the horrific alternative of, th of the cannibal island. Um, and he has a quick moan about people. Uh, he says, uh, uh, all men are provided by nature with notable multiplying glasses through which every little payment appeareth as a great grievance, uh, but they are destitute of the glasses to see afar the miseries that hang over them um, and cannot without such payments be avoided. So it would be much worse if you didn't follow his, uh, his instructions, is what he says in that section. Okay. Um, sovereign authority. He says, I'll... I think I've introduced the key ideas here. What can go wrong? Basically, uh, Hobbes, uh, what can go wrong, Hobbes says, is essentially you can have insufficient absolute power. It's, a, it's the Jeremy Clarkson approach that more or less all problem can be solved if you just apply more absolute power to solve the problem. Um, so problem number is if you don't have enough central authority, uh, then you can have civil conflict comes about. So in particular, one of the reasons he wants to censor the universities and the church is because private judgment of good and evil, if it uh, competes with the law set by the sovereign, uh, will lead people to disobey the laws, and this will lead to civil war. He complains in particular about people imitating the, the Greeks and Romans. So he says, where is this? I've labeled this as Greeks, I think. Um, imit there's a whole section, so in his book he has like, subheadings. And here's one particularly bad thing, imitation of the Greeks and Romans. So he says, as to rebellion in particular against the monarchy, one of the most frequent causes of this rebellion is the reading of books, of policy and of history of the ancient Greeks and Romans, from which young men, if they read them, young men and all others that are unprovided of the antidote of solid reason, namely Hobbes's book, um, will receive a strong and delightful impression of how much they could achieve if they had the, Romans, uh, the Greek or Roman system of government. But they do not consider the frequent seditions and civil wars produced by the imperfection of their policy. In sum, I cannot imagine how anything could be more prejudicial to a monarchy than allowing such books to be publicly read without presently applying such correctives of discreet masters as are fit to take away their venom. Which venom I will not doubt to compare with the biting of a mad dog. That's how bad it is to be allowed to read any, any, just any old book. You've got to be very careful not to be let, let people just read anything, says Hobbes. Not without wise, uh, wise college lecturers to decide which are the correct books to read. 
So I quite like that. I use that. Um, okay. Um, so apart from the fact he argues for absolute government, Hobbes does argue, argue for um, a sort of liberalism. So uh, I said that they, because people set up absolute government in order to have security, um, they can never give up their right to self-defense. Um, they, they can never be a law which binds people to hurt themselves, he means physically. And he interestingly deduces that you cannot have conscription, as far as I, if I've read this correctly, he said that um, you can only, because people have uh, joined this uh, commonwealth or state in order to um, secure themselves from the threat of imminent death, uh, they can only be put into the military voluntarily. Uh, they, can't, they can't be forced to do that because that's going against the threat of death which they set up the state to avoid. So that's a little bit, a little bit of freedom which he allows there. And then when he goes on later in the book to work out, okay, so now that we've got this absolute government, what should its laws be? He sort of suggests that they should be minimal. So the use of laws is not to bind people from all voluntary action, uh, but to direct and keep them in such a motion as not to hurt themselves by their own impetuous desires, rashness, or indiscretion. So laws should be, he says... Uh, like hedges, which are set not to stop travellers, but to keep them along the road, to keep them going along peacefully. And this is a nice enough concept, uh, that you should have a benevolent government, albeit a worryingly absolute one. So he's almost saying that, um, in cases where the so well, he is saying, in cases where the sovereign has prescribed no law, um, there the subject has the liberty to do uh, whatever they want. Um, not according to, um, they don't have to follow m even stricter ethics, they can do what they want. They're almost allowed to pursue, um, they're almost allowed the pursuit of happiness um, to steal from someone else's writing. Um, so that's the dichotomy of Hobbes. Okay. Uh, so let me conclude with so Hobbes recommending his own book. So if you write a long book, don't get to the end and forget to do... So follow Hobbes' example and write a section explaining how great it is. So to conclude, there is nothing in this whole discourse, this book, uh, nor in anything I writ of the same in Latin, as far as I can perceive, which is contrary to either the word of God or to good manners or to the disturbance of public tranquility. It's great, he says, despite the fact I've been talking about how awful and materialistic people are. Uh, at least I'm, I'm justifying these good moral principles from them. So we should totally... And then he says, I think it can be profitably printed and even more profitably taught in the universities. So, yeah, don't forget to put this in your book, that you should definitely... It should be recommended for libraries so that lots of copies can be sold. And, uh, and I think it will be, he says... Um, in case they think also to whom the judgment of the same belongeth. So he's uh, uh, buttering up the, co the college lecturers and hoping they will recommend the teaching of the book. And he butters them up a bit more. Foreseeing the universities are the fountains of civil and moral doctrine. And the universities are from whence the preachers and the gentry, drawing such waters as they find, used to sprinkle the same from both the pulpit and in their conversation upon the people, there ought certainly be great care taken to have it pure, like in my book, both from the venom of heathen politicians and from the incarnation of deceiving spirits, by which I think he means um, illogical reasoning. Okay. Uh, for such truth as opposeth, opposeth no man's profit or pleasure is to all men welcome. So that, that's the recommendation of his own book. So don't forget to do that. Uh, he says, uh, um, oh, when he says colleges at the time, he does actually mean Oxford and Cambridge in England. And in Scotland, he means five universities at the time. Um, uh, oh, yeah. He's talking about civil and moral doctrine. When just, for some reason, I thought I'd highlight that bit of text. Forget that. Right. Um, Leviathan. So what is it? Um, the reason I'd recommend it, if you're going to be working under regulations, is because it's actually very well connected. Um, so it's a response to earlier political theory. And although it's definitely not directly implemented, uh, more modern political theory is very strongly influenced by it. So it's a good starting point uh, for um, 
understanding where your laws are coming from. Uh, another reason I think it's useful is because there's this dichotomy of absolute government and Hobbesian liberalism. Um, this is quite similar to... Um, it, the, well, this, this reminds me of one of the problems we have in political discourse today. Uh, it's not just me that thinks that. So from Alistair MacIntyre, the 20th century's most important moral philosopher, in his book, After Virtue, he criticises um, 20th century uh, political debates or moral debates as being interminable. In other words, people simply can't agree with each other uh, because they uh, aren't working from... Co they have incommensurate arguments. They're not working from the same principles. I think Hobbes' Leviathan is a quite good um, basis to discuss uh, opinions where you have um, a conflict that you can't seem to resolve, uh, simply because his materialist basis uh, does seem to provide a shared starting point from where you can get either extreme absolute government and authoritarianism or liberalism. So in that you can get opposite views from a common starting point, um, it's quite interesting that you could maybe uh, use it as a point to review with people you disagree with uh, to see whether you could uh, both agree on um, his materialism as a possible starting point and then understand the, the opposing argument. Um, and this is by design. So his point is that precisely that um, people have fundamentally different uh, ethics because of different experiences. And so it's no surprise that a book which he's uh, started with that principle and has then deduced laws of um, what uh, of morality and what we should do in governments, it's no surprise uh, that he's able to produce uh, conflicting ends because he said that's the basis. Uh, he says people are fundamentally different uh, principles as a starting point. It's no surprise that he can extrapolate from that to fundamentally different, recom fundamentally conflicting recommendations, absolutism and liberalism. So anyway, maybe I'd been, I, 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 may, I may have had a drink again at that point, but uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, what else did I like about that? I, I generally like Leviathan. These are my conclusions. Uh, I quite like his sense of humour once I eventually managed to read him. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like three or four hundred pages, but it, considering that it covers um, theory of knowledge, so uh, theory of how the brain works up to uh, political theory, it's actually quite compact. I think his disagreement with Aristotle is exaggerated. Um, the Aristotelian starting point that we have shared ethics is really completely consistent with the laws of nature which I think Hobbes deduces. So um, they are simply one example of the kind of shared ethical starting point which Aristotle just takes as given that obviously they exist. And if they were to argue with each other, I'm sure that Aristotle would wipe the floor with Hobbes and would explain that uh, you've just defeated your own counter-argument against me uh, because you've just deduced um, general purpose ethical laws about how government should be run and those are precisely the starting point I had for how a society should be set up. Um, and modern government is quite recognisable from Leviathan, so not exactly, uh, but the concept of executive government or a, a strong president um, is quite recognisable. There are some bits which are not. Um, separation of powers and limited government are definitely not recognisable from Hobbes, uh, but enough of it is recognisable uh, that it, it's worth reading to understand uh, how, your, how your government is set up today. Okay, so that, that's what I wanted to say from my conclusions. I've run on quite a bit longer than I meant to, so sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so I hope that's useful, and I hope that uh, you'll uh, uh, maybe suggest some things that I'll talk about in future. Um, and it'll be different from engineering ethics, uh, which was uh, this talk. Uh, I'll talk about something easier next time, like immortality or something. Okay, good. Right, thank you very much.